Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephen Pagnani, Head of Marketing. Thank you all for coming tonight. Appreciate it. This should be a very interesting lecture. Um, a couple of quick notes before we begin. Um, our Free First Fridays have been renewed by MASCO. We're very excited through June 17th. Anyone who doesn't know them, please share this. The first Friday of every month after 5 p.m., there is no admission to the Institute of Science. So it's a great family night out. We get a very nice turnout. We're grateful to MASCO for that. Next week, our CIS After Dark program presents Build. You'll build everything from a cocktail to a snack bar to um, experiments in building construction and physics. That's for adults 21 plus, information online. And then at the end of this month, the Center, the Center for Collections and Research at Granbrook will present its um, keynote uh, uh, presentation for the season in the form of a lecture about Japanese gardens in America. The Japanese garden at Cranbrook House is one of the earliest of its type in America, as inspired by the exposition of 1915. The booths visited it, came back here, and decided to take a ball area and create a Japanese garden. So we have an expert from Berkeley coming to talk about that. That is free. It's Sunday the 24th, and it takes takes place here. It's um, sponsored by the Japanese Society of America, and a sushi reception will follow in the West Entrance. So if you're free on Sunday the 24th, join us. Tonight we welcome Rodolfo Zunega Vieles, uh, who prioritizes, coordinates, and supervises stewardship and restoration work at all of the proposed project sites in the Southern Fens and Savannah's Conservation Business Plan. He also works closely with other conservation and science staff to develop conservation plans and implement best management practices. Rodolfo has been involved in research, protection, and management of natural resources for 25 years. His duties at the Nature Conservancy include a variety of tasks, such as maintaining and operating equipment, assisting with prescribed fires, and planning, coordinating, and executing field work in order to control invasive plants. Year-round, he supervises a CISO crew of several people. He has directed numerous volunteer workday projects and training events related to restoration and stewardship activities. He also is a certified pesticide applicator license from the state of Michigan. Rodolfo is a native of Costa Rica. One job he worked on there was uh, working as a parataxonomist, both collecting and classifying the flora and fauna of a national park, which contains 35% of Costa Rica's total biodiversity, about six million species. That's a big job. He obtained a BS in business administration with a concentration in natural resources in Costa Rica. His BS thesis dealt with a proposal to create a biological corridor among several protected areas an initiative which was later adopted and implemented by the government of Costa Rica. In the US, he obtained a master's degree in tropical sustainable development from Cornell University, his thesis topic being the impact of protected area expansion on local rural communities. And he's also done coursework toward a PhD. Roe is married, has two children, lives in Albion, Michigan. His wife is a history professor at Albion College. He enjoys trains, builds N-scale train layouts, and loves, of course, traveling to Costa Rica often. Rodolfo, welcome to Cranbrook. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here uh, again. Um, from Costa Rica, I'm going to give a talk about uh, fire, fire in the state of Michigan. Uh, um, it's been an honor for me uh, to uh, work for the Nature Conservancy. I did it for a couple of years in Costa Rica, and then down here in the state of Michigan, I've been for around 12 years. So our talk, uh, it is called Burn, Baby Burn, and I hope that by the end of this talk, uh, you guys will understand what this means. So that being said, we're going to start. Before we do that, I would like to make sure that uh, uh, everybody turns their cell phones off, please. I'm going to start doing that, doing mine. So we don't in interrupt um, each other. All right, so go ahead inside. <clears throat> As I say, I work for the Nature Conservancy, um, but uh, sometimes I, w I would like to say that the Nature Conservancy works for me. Uh, it has been a wonderful uh, trip uh, for the last uh, 12 years. Our mission is down there along with our vision. And uh, basically what we do is just try to protect biodiversity in as many ways as we can. And then when I say biodiversity, uh, what we are talking about here is diversity of life. It is uh, not only the diversity of different species, 
plants, insects, animals, but also the diversity of ecosystems and the interrelationship among them. So we have species, ecosystems, and all the interrelations among those. So it is a very, very uh, big, big, big task, uh, but we are a science-based organization. So we try to uh, take into account science before we make any, any move particularly with uh, fire, uh, restoration management, and so on. So, yes, the Nature Conservancy, uh, we have been around for around 60 years. The whole organization uh, is uh, about 600 scientists. Uh, the TNC has more than uh, 3,000 employees. Uh, we work all over the planet, 35 countries, we have over a million members. And for those of you guys who are members, thank you so much for your support. We really appreciate it. And uh, we have uh, protected around 120 million acres. That's a big accomplishment. We don't do it alone. We need uh, your support. And we also work in collaboration with a lot of other organizations, government, local government, NGOs, the feds, et cetera. Um, yes, we work glo globally. Uh, I am an example of that. I used to work for TNC in the Santa Rosa National Park in Costa Rica. And um, we go from all over the place uh, trying to protect the waters and uh, all those uh, uh, rare specimens or those rare habitats that sustain biodiversity. Down here in Michigan, um, we uh, have been um, working very hard on protecting the rarest and the most unique samples of biodiversity. Uh, and uh, we have come with uh, these kind of areas that you see down here. Um, And in those areas is where TNC is investing the time, the money. It is where it is putting the science at work. And, and uh, because uh, those sites represent where the hot spots are. So like, um, not like the National Park Service or other organizations that tend to protect cultural attributes, we are uh, chasing biodiversity, where the hot spots are. So we have different projects, and I am in charge of this one down here that it is called Southern Fence and Savannah. So I am in charge of restoring fence, which is a particular kind of uh, wetland um, with uh, a lot of uh, rare and endangered species, plants, insects, and uh, other biodiversity. In general, we protect uh, more than 300 and almost 370,000 acres, and it is growing. Uh, when we say protection, it is that either we own land, we manage land, we assist other NGOs to manage and protect their land too, for the, hate, for, for the sake of biodiversity. So 370,000 acres is a lot. So. Now going back to, to fire, and then the reason why I'm here is to talk about more in depth about this. Uh, the state of Michigan, you know, you think that you know, around 1800s down here, around 2.7 million acres of all the Michigan land uh, was fire de dependent. Now, obviously, it is 2016. Those numbers have decreased, but in 1800, you know, 2.7 uh, million acres were uh, uh, acres uh, were composed of uh, uh, ecosystems that were fire de dependent, and in those 2.7 million acres, about 30 percent of uh, biodiversity of the whole state uh, lived there. Now, because of human expansion, that those numbers have uh, are very very small now. Um, just to let you guys know, uh, less than 2% of the national, well, the native forest 
that were he down here in 1800s are, 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 are only left. Uh, that means that around 98% of the native forest in the state of Michigan has been at some point cut down. So originally only 1.90 something. So that's you know how devastating the situation that down here has, has been. Same thing all over the, the planet. In Costa Rica, the same thing. In, Bra in Brazil, that's the same story. It's all over. Fire. When you think about fire, I want you to put these things. You know, there is good fire and bad fire. So we are going to try to talk about both and how uh, um, we will deal with, with this kind of situation. Around 60% of the land down here in the state of Michigan is fire dependent, still, even though you know, a lot of those, of those areas are being converted into ag and cities and other land uses. Could you explain what fire dependent means? Fire dependent, it is an ecosystem that, it is, um, that this need, needs fire on a regular basis. Uh, for the southern fence and savannas where I work, those are wetlands, and those wetlands we know because uh, scientists have drilled cores into the ground, and we can tell uh, exactly when there was a wildfire that came out there. They, 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 you could time all that stuff. And then we know that in, in southern Michigan, for example, around every six to seven, 11 to 13 years, more or less in that range, there was a wildfire going, going, going through. It could be a wildfire that started in northern Ohio and came across all the way up to Michigan. Because back in those days, there were no roads. So when there was a wildfire, it just raged over. Now there is more roads and there is more things. So roads act as, a, as a fire breaks, but also we have the tendency to stop fires, so there is more fuel load. So the fires are more intense. Those fires were most likely fires that were under the, uh, you know, they were they probably the, the length or the flames were a couple of feet. And there were fires that didn't crown up to the trees. They did, didn't go up. So does that answer your, your question? Thank you. Yeah, all right. So the wildland fire is something that it is here. It is it's being here before we got here. So what we did when we arrived down here we start building roads and we start putting a break on this natural ecological process. So yes, we have down here what it looks like to be like a savanna. This looks like to be an open oak barrens. And you can see how many trees you find down, down here. You know, in the place where we work in southern Michigan, we have oak barrens and oak savanna remnants. And uh, his, historically, they have in between uh, six to 12 trees, mature trees per acre. And there are some places where there are remnants down there where the density of trees, it is about you know, 70 per acre. There are way too many trees, and the reason why is because we have stopped fire. And the fire is stopped going through all these areas. Um, cleaning the under story. Down here we have like a Pine, there is a lot of fuel down here. Um, there is an oak savanna down here in this other picture. Um, this is more or less what the um, explorers, the sur surveyors saw down here when they came down here uh, a, long, a long time. They say on, the, on their notes, you know, as they were walking, surveying the land, they described what they saw, and they saw more or less this. Uh, nowadays, if you go out, you will see that the tree density, the shrub is higher. And all is due because of the lack of fire. Fire is a natural process. And 60% of the state of Michigan is fire dependent. This is a prairie. We have a savanna. We have some openings down here. And barrens. So, and there is also forest that we don't have down here in this picture, and wetlands. So I work in a type of a wetland, it is called fen, and it is a wetland, but it is fire adapted, it's fire dependent. The animals that live there, the use that habitat are adapted to the fire, but to a certain kind of fire, and it is the fire that used to be here before the 1800s. So you know, it is a low intensity fire 
uh, it is not that you know, raging fire that go on the crowns of the trees and creates a lot of damage. So that's the, the bad fire. Natural communities, uh, we have a lot down, down here, and you see these numbers down here. The red ones are the ones who are uh, more in danger. Uh, the second ones are the ones who are so-so, and the third ones are ones to steal. The, uh, are very, very hard to, to find, but they are still there. Uh, as, you, as you can see, you know, hill here, uh, hillside, prairie, dry, misty prairie, all these places, you know, are more or less uh, uh, easily found in the southern, southern part of the state of Michigan. And that's where most of the uh, human de development is. So these areas are being highly impacted by humans. Uh, and as a matter of fact, the further south you go, the, more, the smaller those remnants are. And it is where TNC is working, trying to re revert a little bit that. Um, we have more. All of these are fire dependent. So fire and these ecosystems animals, insects, and their interrelationships are dependent on the regular fire going down there. Again, it could be every 10 years, every 17 years, but there was fire at any given time that they're going through, cleaning up that understory. Um, there are some fire critical communities too, too and then you know, coastal plain marsh. We don't have those. Uh, there are a few samples down here in the south of Detroit, for example, but they are so degraded that they are just basically gone. And it will take a lot of money, a lot of time and resources to try to recreate those. Uh, basically because a lot of hy the hydrology has been altered and that costs and takes a lot of money. Um, all these ecosystems are far de de dependent. You know, down here we see a lot of trees. You know? and it should be fewer than the ones that are de depicted there. So what do we mean by you know, fire de dependent? Well, you know, there are a lot of insects, animals that depend on fire. The classical example is that the pine cone. You know, it needs the heat that comes from the fire, so those pine cones will you know, trigger and open up those, those ceilings, that, you know, those seeds that are going to be later on trees. Um, we work with Massasaga rattlesnakes snakes on wetlands that are fire de de dependent. Those Massasagas require, require some kind of habitat that there is a mix of shrub with openings and some open areas so they could go down there and, and you know, b uh, basket. And, but also they like to have the refugia and they would like to have, you know, crayfish so they could hide in those caves down there, you know, when there is a, you know, an animal or something, they go under. Uh, but the, oh, the only way that those ecosystems are the way that, you know, they were in the 1800s is that we allow fire to go down there and do its job. Um, again, uh, we have the historic vegetation and um, most of these areas down here, and we are located more or less around here, you know, we are at the core of the fire dependent uh, ecosystem. There are some areas down here too that require fire, uh, and some in the UP, believe it or, 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 or not. And then down here you can see the different types of uh, forests that s still are. You know, most of them are gone. Just rem remember, the native forest in the state of Michigan is less than 2% remain. The forests that you see in the UP are just the regrowth, or those forests that were cut in uh, 1800s and over. So they are still wonderful. They are nice, nice, nice forests. But the original ones are, you know, gone. So the great fires. <sighs> That's one of those things. Um, once the humans arrive down here, particularly in this area, you know, the first thing that we, you know, that's those migrants, they start, you know, using the natural resources that were available to them. One of those was 
wood. So a lot of big pines and all these hardwoods were cut down. And you know, in uh, around 1871 and later in 1881, there were some events before this down here where there were uh, a couple of years of high downpours. There were a lot of rain um, in the previous 10, 10, 10, 10 years. You know, the, the cycle goes like, you know, it's dry periods, a lot of rain, dry periods, and that, what, that cycle creates or generates a lot of fuel. Well, what happened down here, in particular in the 1881, there was a wildfire down here, we call it the Huron Fire, somebody called it the Thumb Fire. Um, back in those, in 1881, um, there, was a, a, there were a lot of, lo of um, logging industries down here that were just cutting down the, the wood as fast as they could. And they left a lot of slush. On top of that, there were a couple of years of extreme drought. And uh, there was an, an event, there were some kind of winds that came from the north and then swept down, down here. Down, 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 down here. And this uh, originated one of these wild wildfires. One of these was the, this, this one. Down here, it burned one million acres in one single day. So 125 people lost their lives. A lot of houses were lost. It is just it's something catastrophic. But in part, this happened because of human, because there was a lot of fuel down there that was available. And in part, was because you know, nature has these uh, cycles. You know. And um, there is this other fire down here, the Manistee fire, it was you know, from one lake into the other, the other you know. And uh, the Holland fire, and then of course the Chicago fire that you guys have, have heard of. So, but, you know, those fires are just, you know, part of the, I say, the natural history of this part of the country. So, we have here, for example, the Duck Lake, whom, how many of you remember this? Uh, yeah, there was in 2012, uh, most likely it was a lightning, and then it burned down here. You see the, light, the lightning right here, and it went And burned this in, um, in two weeks, 21,000 acres. Thanks God, because of this lake, you know. Otherwise, I think we have gone through Canada and all. You know. uh, but again, you know, the, the fuels that, that were here, you see how many trees per acre. And then, you know, the fuel load, because probably the lack of regular wildfires that otherwise would be burning just the understory, there was a lot of fuel accum accumulated down there, and then that fuel went from here into the crown. And then you know, the space in between those, we call it ladder. Ladder fuel, that like you go up to a ladder. So that's what happens when you, know, you stop fire. So this is a, a bad fire, <laughs> obviously. Um, and then you know, other fires uh, are, are more or less uh, um, have been occurring in the out west. You hear all these news. And it is the same situation. Down here, it could be a, a couple of, you know, couple of bad years with, with droughts. In California, it could be the El Nino, that you know, it is not raining or there is too much wind, the Santa Ana's or something winds, and then that creates a disaster. So, for example, down here in 2010, um, as uh, the settlers started moving, we went through Michigan, got uh, probably 98% of all the forest down here were cutting down. They left slashy, they kept moving into Wisconsin, they were all going all the way out, out west. There was a series of situations around um, before 1910, when there was a combination of a drought, high winds, uh, high concentration of fuel, you see how many trees. And then there was a lighting, and some other people think that there was a steam locomotive that you know, throws some cinders and started a, a fire uh, um, and then um, there was a huge huge wildfire that you know combined you know Idaho parts of I Idaho I think Washington even British Columbia 
And you know, it burned around three million a acres. Uh, it was something that you know, nobody knew what to do about it. And uh, um, this um, started, you know, because the effects were so high, uh, the effects were so devastating that they started thinking about, well, we need to start doing something to stop those fires. And it is when, uh, more or less, this guy came alive by, uh, around 1940s. And his message, even though it was good in intention, was, you know, stop fires, stop fires. Yeah, there are some fires that you need to stop because they are going to, you know, kill people, they could go and destroy property. But there are some fires that are, 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 are good. And then since, since then, you know, the, the mentality is, there is a fire, let's go and put it out. There is another fire, let's go and put it out. And that approach uh, has been challenged in the last probably 10, 10, 10 years. And we're going to talk about that. So, wildland fires, you know, this is a good fire. This is actually me, many years ago. And this is, we're burning a prairie uh, near Ives Road Fen, which is by Tecumseh in the southern part of the state down here. And this is the Sleepy Lake wildfire that was done here by, in the UP. That burned around um, 18,000 18, plus acres. I was, I, I was there in, the, in, in this fire, it was just a mess. Um, good fire, bad fire. Good fire is under control, there is a fire break, and there is con contingency, there is some guy down here with water, there is a plan how we're going to burn the burner, how, you know, what the fire is going to be doing, all these things. This is totally out of control down here. Um, so we talk about prescribed fire and wildfire. And then you can see all this. Uh, when we do a prescribed fire, a prescribed burn, we take, uh, we, we plan, we have a plan, we have a prescription that it is going to tell us what's the, the wind speed, the, how many days in rain, the relative humidity. Uh, we're going to uh, control, we're going to limit where the fire is going to go. We put hand brakes or fire, fire brakes. So you, you can see one, one here. Uh, and we have a lot of control over that uh, baby. Uh, and there is a lot of, you know, we're going to, to hold that burner there and then we're going to let it burn, you know. But like, unlikewise, you know, the, the wildfire is totally the opposite. Now, um, there is something that, you know, in the last 10 years, I just mentioned that, in between this, the wildfire and the prescribed fire, and it is called uh, wildland, sorry, wildland fire management, or for management. That means that sometimes uh, there is a lighting that hits down, down here and starts a, a wildfire. The firefighters go down there and instead of putting it out, they are going to study what type of fuels are there, what are the weather conditions for the next couple of weeks, and if the, the fire is going to behave in the way that it is used to in the 1800s, we are going to let it go under certain control. We are going to hold it down here a little bit, slow it down down here, we are going to let it go down there until it goes out. Obviously, if there is a building, um, a population or something, we're going to stop it down, down there. But there is something in between down, down here. We are spending, we're overspending too much fire, taking care of wildfires, when we could sometimes, not all of the, of the times, allow the wildfire to do its thing without uh, putting at risk any resources, infrastructure of the people. Uh, As we said, this is a, a fire under control. This fire it is going backwards. This is burning backwards. So we call it a backing fire. And it is even though the fuels are low, the fuels are not going to go up here. It's going to go burning, burning, burning. Likewise here. 
You might see a little bit of flames down here, uh, but still, this fire is under control. This is under control. This is a fen. This is one of those wetlands that uh, I burn um, often. And then, you know, this is a completely out of control wildfire. Once a, a wildfire reaches the, the crowns, you get out of there. There's nothing that you can do. You could bring the tankers, you could spend some money, whatever. The best thing that you could do is just wait until you control it, you know, protect some properties or some communities or infrastructure that might be in the way. Other than that, just let it go. You know, you're not going to, and then wait for a moment when this fire is going to come down here and come down. And then you're going to pinch it down here and control it there. But no, nobody goes in down there. It is like jumping off of a cliff. Yeah. So uh, we have this fire uh, that was uh, not so long ago, like uh, all those fires, uh, they were, you know, 5,000 acres, you know, 2,000 homes burned, you know, town, the towns were in, in the way of, of the, all these things. And, you know, the thing is that there is a lot of uh, accumulated fuel down there that hasn't been burned as it used to be. So when there is a, a wildfire, most likely that fire is going to be out, totally out of control. And that's what you see in California, sometimes out in the West Coast. Uh, uh, and then we still keep building houses where we shouldn't. And we don't protect those houses. The houses are down there, and they are totally surrounded by fuels. So whenever there is a wildfire, the house is going to go. Um, next one. So this is more or less a cycle. Is what I have been talking about. Um, let's see what time? Thirty-eight. Um, you burn it, either you or Mother Nature, and then you know. The fire, if it is a good fire, not the fire that go up in the top of the crowns, it is going to have some good effect on the vegetation, on the biodiversity. Why? Because they are adapted to those kind of conditions. Now, if it is a raging fire, you know, and, and the, the, the heat is too, too much, that heat is going to sterilize. It's going to kill everything. And that's when you go and you see those wildfires and then nothing is growing on. The soil is bare for years and then the rains come and then there is erosion and flooding, and it is a mess. So the good fire, sometimes it's done by mother nature, depending on the situation, the fire goes on the ground, it doesn't climb up. That helps biodiversity. I know if you have been in a situation where you say, oh, somebody burned this, and then like two weeks after that, everything is green. So those are fire adapted ecosystems. And then, you know, the forest grows again, and then it reaches kind of a point again where, you know, things are getting out of waco and then, or whack, and then, uh, uh, um, you know, there is another, you know, fire or a controlled burn or a wildfire and goes this, this cycle. If you get out and you don't burn, you are going to have all those stands. Those forests are going to get thicker and thicker, and that fire is going to create a lot of damage. And that's not good. Um, that's just to reiterate what I say. So, yeah, believe it or not, uh, nature has a reset button. And that is a lighting, or in most cases nowadays, it is us trying to mimic mother nature. And, and sometimes it is a mistake because you know, we lose a burn or something. But, uh, yeah, there's re reset down here in Michigan, it used to be every six, seven, or 11 to 13 years. It was that fire going. Um, the reasons why, these are the, uh, the advantages of a good fire, Rem remember. If the fire is too hot, it is going to sterilize everything and kill everything, too. So, we use controlled burns in some sites where we have invasive plant species. And we know that those invasive plant species are not from here, so they are not fire adapted. Um, so when we burn, we try to conduct those burns when the invasive species are just about to leave out. So they are putting all that energy into growing again. Then you know, we burn those areas, 
And then uh, we do a lot of tough killing uh, of those invasive plants, and sometimes we kill them. That's how we use fire as a management tool nowadays, in addition to all these points that you guys can see down, down, down here. One particular point, and I have around 10 minutes, it is like, you know, when we mention, or when we say this is a fire adapted ecosystem, that doesn't mean that all the species are going to survive. That means that the, exactly the majority of the species are going to withstand those fires and move on. Um, we have instances where we burn on uh, federally endangered Mitchell Cedar butterflies. And uh, we have to prescribe a burn in certain conditions where the fire is not going to be too extreme, too hot, because it might be not good for the butterflies. Massasaga rattlesnake, which is uh, you know, a, state can a federal candidate for endangered species. For example, we have learned that the, the rate of the spread of that fire, you know, how fast the fire moves, you know, the head or the, the backing fire, we never, almost never burn with a head fire. We always, if the wind is going this way, we put the line down here and the fire is backing. That rate of the spread, how fast the fire moves, it has to be no faster than, uh, put it on there, five meters a minute. And you could do the com conversion to feet. Five, five meters is more or less from here to that wall down there. So if the fire moves in one minute this fast, we still could burn. And most of the Massasagas, if not all of them who are there, will have the chance to go down there and go under. And we have done studies. We have introduced transmitters into Massasaga rattlesnakes, put it into an area randomly, and then we are tracking down there, and then we start a, a fire. And most of them have been able to go under the ground that is a, under a rock or something, a hole, a crayfish or something hole. And then we have pictures where the fire is going down, down there. It's going down there, and then a Massasaga, it is just coming up. Down, down here. Now, if the rate of the spread of the fire is faster than that, we might end up, you know, killing some of them. You know, likewise, that happened with a lot of other animals. You know, reptiles, snakes, um, you name it, uh, amphibians sometimes. So we are very careful when we make a prescription to make sure that we met those goals so you know, we don't have negative effects on biodiversity. Um, as you can tell, you know, these animals are happy. The nest is, is there now. If this was a wildfire, it is a different story. All right. A um, few more minutes. This is more or less. It shows what a control burn looks like. There are fire breaks, and then the wind is going that way down there, and we start probably ignition down here, coming this way, and then the fire is doing a backing fire. And uh, um, this is what we call a hmm, control burn or prescribed burn. Um, what do you think that we, we should call this? Who said that? <laughs> Who think it is, it is both? <laughs> you gotta have. <laughs> both. It's both because, you know, it is under control, but somebody prescribes the conditions under which we will be doing this work. Now, in this planet, in this part of the, of the world now, uh, um, the correct, the politically correct uh, description is prescribed. Because you are doing a controlled burn, and if you lose it, <laughs> it is not controlled. And then, uh, because you are going to lose one. It is like you, when you started you know, learning how to ride a bike, you are going to hit the ground. It is a matter of how hard, how soon, or how late. You know, I don't, you know, most, uh, we are very, ex extremely well-trained and safe, 
but we cannot be mother nature. Uh, and at some point, we're going to lose one. So the prescribed sounds better from a legal point of view. Too. <laughs> so the prescription, this is all those things that we take into consideration before we go down there and throw a match. There is a lot of planning. There is a lot of uh, training. There is a lot, you know, we have a burn plan. I don't know where I have my burn plans. Um, but there is a document that is around 15 pages where it, it says exactly how we're going to do it, and that's a legal document. Because if I am going to implement that control burn or that prescribed burn, uh, I have to, uh, you know, do it according to what it is down there. I cannot go out. If it says maximum wind speed is 13 miles per hour, and then I get up in the morning and it is 20 miles, I'm out of commission. If it says, you know, relative humidity, it could be in between, you know, 45% to 20. If it goes below to 20, you are out. And if you go down there and you're going to start a burn, and you know that by 4 or 3:30 the relative humidity is going to be 18, you better go home because you are going to be in, in trouble. You don't want to be and start doing that uh, prescribed burn, and then halfway you need to put it out because you are out of prescription. So there is a lot of things. You know, we. Our, one of our biggest concerns is smoke, smoke, particularly in these kind of situations down here, we, we call it uh, the urban interface. And you know, there is highways, there is people, there is business, there is railroads, there is airports. You know, one of the biggest things is where do we put the smoke? Um, and we always take all these precautions, you know. Um, you know, signs and all these things. People, when they see fire, they have the tendency to stop. Um, again, you know, we build fire, fire breaks, we monitor the weather constantly. And you know, we get a permit. And the permit is given to us by the local fire de department. If they say no, it is no. Some burn the par uh, fire departments want 100% mop up or clean up at the very end. Some people say, you know, 25 uh, feet from the brake line in. And some people are, you know, 100, or some people don't worry about it. All depends where you are at. Very quickly, again, we monitor the weather. This, we get ready. Each uh, crew member gets brief uh, about what are we going to do, it, how we're going to do it, and then we start burning. This actually is in Nebraska. Um, and we start burning. Sometimes the units are huge, 3,000 acres, 2,000. Down here, we are just building a black line. So you didn't see it down here, but there was these guys with this hose were wetting this down here, and then somebody was burning it, and then there was another crew down here wetting the other edge. So you create this black line. So that is what we call black line. And this is good because we could go down there and, and work for, uh, for a week, building this black line around 3,000 acres and then uh, the next day we could go down there and burn it because you know the fire would be con contained. This is probably around 20, 25 feet. The fire is not going to jump over here unless you are burning with 40 mile per hour winds, which it will throw you out of prescription. Uh, and this is another type of thing yeah, of uh, way that we do fires. We go around the perimeter, you know, and we go down there and. Um, as you saw on the previous slide, you know, we, we start burning down here on, on the edges and then down here and then close it down, down here. This is what they are doing down here. Yeah. And we are burning down there because of uh, bisons. It is a ranch in ne 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 Nebraska <coughs> and there is a, a bison down there that they need that new grass. And then the ugliest thing about burning is that after you burn, if the fire department says, you know, 100% mop up, before you leave down there, there should be no smoldering, no nothing. It could be out. It has to be out. And then after this is completed and everything is, is fine and everything, and then you have a debriefing, what we call a, 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 a AAR, 
after action review. It is a debriefing, and we go down there and we put our cro crocodile skin, and we get criticized for w the good and the bad that we did. And the idea is to learn from each other. So, very, very soon. And then this is more or less what a classical firefighter looks like, you know. Uh, I guarantee this smile is because she's just beginning to do that. <laughs> After 12 years, you know, her face you cannot find it because it is dirty and she's going to be, I want to get out of here. <laughs> but, you know, she has everything, gloves, camera, you know, cheap water, all these things, fire shelters, as some of you saw and everything. But there is only one thing that I don't like about this picture. Could somebody pick something up? Well, what it is wrong about here? Oh, hair. Thank you. Who said hair? Yeah. Oh, here you go. <laughs> this is a hat from uh, Guatemala. Thank you. Very good. So, yeah, it is one of those no, no, no. Uh, uh, um, we usually, when we have, she probably has her radio down here on this side. I use my radio down here. It is like a pouch or something. And then inside, there is like a, something like a Velcro that you open and I keep papers down, down there. One day I was burning, I didn't close it up. There were, I, I have maps on there and other things, you know. And I was just holding this line and looking, it looks good, but I, sm I smell some smoke and then there were some trees, there's nothing down there. And look around and nothing. And Amber just fell in between that and it was burning my pouch down, down, down here. You know, just imagine what it could do down, down here if you have long, long hair and all of a sudden you're looking and your hair is on fire. Anyway, <laughs> good answer down there. So it's one of those things. Um, so Nomex is a fabric that resists fire? Yes. And it is also being tied. There is some components down here. This is a Nomex. And I already have two kids. So <laughs> it is. <laughs> It is being known to have some components down there that s sterilize you. So pretty soon there will be a huge lawsuit and everything will be. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, Nomex, and then you know the boots. It has to be you know leather boots and other kind of stuff. You know with nice socks, water. You have food on here for several days, um, and you have your radio. Um, down here, what it is missing is a headlamp. You have to have one, it's probably. And then inside your helmet, you have some earplugs, because sometimes you work close to equipment, you put your earplugs. Um, and I think, you know, that's it. We're going to go faster a bit. These are some of the tools that we do. He, she, or he is doing in a ignition along the perimeter. Uh, this is how things look after they, they burn. They are just, she's burning. This guy down here with this ATV is holding, and then later they, they come down, down here just to make sure that everything is fine. Likewise, down, down here, this guy is holding for him. Ignition comes down here, and then there is another one down here. He's making sure that the fire doesn't jump over. But look at the smoke. The smoke is going in. And uh, we have a lot of tools. Uh, one of these that we don't use anymore. We use a blister. They are plastic now. Uh, this is a, we have water down, down here. So we have to be physically fit to carry 45 pounds and over into the, 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 the field. Sometimes it's 70, 80 pounds. Uh, and we have to pass some tests in order to be a firefighter. So we need to hike three miles in less than 45 minutes with 45 pounds on our backs. So every year. And then we have to practice and practice. This is the fire shelter. This is, the, the, this is like a tent that we have down here in case uh, we uh, get entrapped. So we will deploy that thing down here and then go and roll over. Um, these are guys who are working, uh, building fire, fire breaks. So we do a lot of trainings. Uh, we have a lot of experience. I, I burn all over the place. So whenever I could go and get a hold of an opportunity to burn in a different place I go, it's more experience for, for, for me. We are very competent. Uh, we are very pro, pro, professional. We have leadership uh, among our people. We are continuing learning, and we have to be physically fit. Yet, sometimes we lose burns, and that's something that happens. Very quickly, this is how all the, the, the training curriculum 
that TNC has. TNC abides to NWCG. It's the same rules that uh, rules uh, the, 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 the feds, for example. It is the um, National uh, Coordinating Working Group. And if you want to become a firefighter, you take these classes online. And then you go to a, a burn. And then we will pair you up with somebody who has been there. And if you perform well, and then you say you are a firefighter type two. You know. And from there, you open up a task book, which is a, 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 like a, a notebook with around uh, probably 20 pages with a lot of tasks that you need to comply. One of those is uh, showing up to a, a wildfire with your shoes are tied. Some of them are just uh, you know, going into a, a wildfire. There is a different kind of tasks. Once you comply with that task book and you are done with these classes, you are a firefighter type one. And then you go, then like that as you see good resource. Um, I am more or less here. Uh, I really, I need to take this class and then fill out my task book and then I will be a, a burn bus type, type two. Um, and this is more or less what we, what we are trying to look into when we say we would like somebody to get trained. Um, in this takes the whole process from here to here, depending on the situation, in between um, five to 12 years. So there is a lot of, you know, sometimes you could go faster, sometimes you go slower. Um, there is, if you want to become a firefighter, um, half of our firefighter force is about to re retire um, um, in the next five years. And there is a gap down there because the, the, the system is not producing enough firefighters, fast in, enough to fill out those uh, voids. So there is going to be a lot, a lot of need for firefighters in the next five to, to, to 10 years. So this is what, 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 what I have. Um, and then uh, pretty soon uh, I will allow you to have some questions. And but, uh, for those who are not members, we um, invite you to consider to become a member. You have all these benefits down, down here. Uh, you could talk to our guys down there. They, they have that uh, table down there. They could give you information about this. Um, we need to give back. Uh, something that I have learned over my years. Um, I'm a 55-year-old guy. Uh, I grew up in the tropics. When I was uh, 17, 18 years old, I, was, uh, I, be, I worked for a logging company in Costa Rica. I did a lot of damage. And then um, later on, I, I learned that I have to give back uh, to the gen generations. I'm doing it now, down here in the US. That doesn't matter. I have two kids who are from this country. And uh, uh, we need to give back. And there is a lot of ways that you could go to give back. Uh, one is volunteering, one is just becoming a, a member and get, getting involved. So in the near future, there is another talk that it, it is coming. Dr. Ewart it is coming to talk to uh, you guys on here on May 5th, and he loves birds. Um, <laughs> apparently, I'm from the tropics. Costa Rica has like around 840 bird species, and I recognize probably 10. I never pay attention to them. <laughs> The way it is. So, and we have our annual spring treasure hunt. You are more than welcome. This year is going to be at Ives Road Fen. I'm going to be there. Uh, hopefully, we'll have good weather and we'll see some birds and some plants. We, we, we'll see how things go. It could be probably a feet of snow, as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah. But it is going to be May 7th, so hopefully, it will be all right. And, uh, you know, you could also go online for those of you who like, you know, play online. And, you know, we have. Uh, uh, chats online that you could be part of too, and then uh, you are more than welcome uh, to uh, assist. So, this is me, and you know, I'm smiling because I've been in the field for two weeks, 180 hours. So, thank you so much. Okay, now we have around five, ten minutes for questions if you have any. Yes. Sorry. Fires that you, um, are, that you run or 
Yeah, well, uh, most likely, uh, well, yeah, most of the control burns or the fly burns, if you wish, are in TNC land. We also have uh, uh, collaborative agreements uh, with the adjacent landowners. If we want to preserve it, then our adjacent landowner, the, the fan goes into it or whatever, and then we have an agreement. They have to sign a waiver saying that, you know, we won't sue you, we will sue us. And, uh, and you know, if the fire goes out of control or something happens, we have insurance. But you know, we are totally safe in the, in the state of Michigan. We have not a single fire has been out, out of control, no escape. We also have agreements with the U.S. Forest Service. So if they have a burn, because we abide to the NWCG standards, we could go to them and work with them. In the past, we used to burn up north by grading. There is a lot, a lot of hunting hunt clubs. Travel along, we have agreements with them. DNI pay us to go down there, and then the US Fish and Wildlife send a couple of agents to help us. So we don't work alone, I mean. Yeah. But yeah, most of the burns are on that right now. Yeah? When you're uh, getting ready for a burn, how long does it take to plan? Are you talking <laughs> days, weeks, months, years? <laughs> All depends how, how much you like to push papers. <laughs> um, a burn plan is always around a 14 page long document. Some of them, once you have one, and if it is a similar one, it's a copy and paste kind of thing. But there is an area where, when, where, that there is more or where the prescription is. And it is where you have to work on that, and it's not as a one of them. I want, because there are some goals, and then some of the goals, it could be just to, to burn duff. So it is a simple as that. We burn it with this kind of condition. My. Because we want just to reduce fuels. But sometimes we want to hit invasive species, so we need to put a little bit more octane, so that it will be a little bit harder. But we need to be careful because there is much salad on that. So you start playing with, with that. Um, again, you never beat mother nature. Uh, and then you never rush things. So yeah, it would take probably a burn plant. I think it probably will take you half a day, but then the burn plan has to be approved. If I write it, I'm not a burn bus. It has to get approved by my, soup, my, my burn bus, and then two other people within T, T and C. There is something that is called complexity rating. If that complexity rating goes above a certain number, it is a high risk. So we have to talk to Helen Teller or the state director to let her know. So this is a you know, high complexity burn, but this is how we're going to mitigate that. And then she's informed and after that, we need to send that, that in each burn plan to a third party. Somebody who doesn't work for TNC who's going to review that, and he or she probably is going to be able to see some flaws and there. That's you know, the whole process. And then there is a permit uh, part. Uh, if you are burning where there is an uh, endangered butterflies or anything, you need a use fish and wildlife, and that takes up to two months. Okay. You have a question? Yeah. Actually, I have two. Um, yeah. You mentioned earlier something about too many trees, or there should be a certain number of trees per acre. Uh, is there a number, and is that also dependent on the type of area it's in, what type of soil, et cetera? Yeah, it is. Again, you know. We think that we know, but we are just, you know, making baby steps. Uh, what we know is for all savannas, it is in between, you know, seven to 12 trees per acre. That is a range. All depends on the situation. If you have a property that has a north-facing slope down here, that property is going to be probably colder than the one that there is a south-facing slope. So probably the density of trees down there doesn't matter much. Because of, if the fire goes down there, it's going to be kind of, the relative humidity is going to be higher. And then the south facing slope is going to burn harder because you have more exposure from the sun down here. So down here, yeah, it would be more important to reduce that, that, that quantity of trees. Yeah, I go to New Mexico, for example, Ponderosa Pines. They say that the average down there per acre is around seven. And then right now they are in the range between 900 to 1100 trees per acre, wow. per acre, sorry. 
So that's why there is a huge amount of money going down there to thin out the, the forest, burn down all the fuel, and then with that, the next wildfire. Instead of going on the top of the, of the crowns, it's going to go down and it completely under control. Does that have a second question? Yes, I do. Um, when you start these fires, these controlled fires, do you plan them so that you're just burning for one day and it's like out in one day? Or is this going day and night, day and night? Yeah. I don't know if you saw the size, some of those are kind of dark. All that depends. You, you, in a, in a plant, you more or less guess how many hours it's going to take. Usually, down here in this part of the state, no more than eight, because working at night there is more risk. Some people get injured. You cannot see or the other thing. But you know, sometimes we do deliberately go over, and then when, and then we start with what we call working shifts or groups, and then 25 fighters are going to be working from you know when we you put fire on the ground, say. 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. and then after that is going to be another group going down there and then this is going to go to rest and have dinner and take a shower there. But sometimes it is just long, long, long hours. I've been on the fire line sometimes from 11 a.m. to 2 in the morning where it's still burning. So does someone stay while it's smoldering or, yeah? Sometimes depending on the situation. Assuming that, you know, as you see, you remember that slide where there was that beautiful burn and everything. If we burn this stuff, you know, and everything is out, no smoke, no smoldering, the next day, a firefighter or two that are at least five, five times one qualified need to go down there and do the last review. And they go down there and check everything, and then they call the burn box and say the burn is out. So he would go down there and write on the, on, on the plant, burn is out as of this day, officially out. And that's a little document. Because sometimes, you know, your neighbor burns some brush or something and starts a wildfire and says, oh, PNC was burning down here, it's calling amber coming on it. But if there is a document and there is a code of order that says, you know, the burn was out, it was out. So there's a standard that's used from state to state to state? Well, and then from township to township. So I, I guarantee you down here in this area because of the urban interface, houses and forests, the fire departments down here are going to be like, oh, you know, oh, we have a hospital down there. We have a situation down there by Kalamazoo where we have down here Amtrak, 110 miles per hour, per hour a, a busy road down here, and then down here the city of Buchanan, and then down here some industries. Among those in industries, a, a candy factory. If that kind of factory, if we burn that day even with the, with the north wind that down here, pulling the smoke, if there was a speck of smoke down there and they, the, the, the bends of that factory picked up some scent of the, produ the production of the day would get ruined. And then we'll have to pay. So there is very risky situations down there. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, burn buses hate, or don't like, hate is hate. They don't like, uh, uh, burning in this kind of situation because the risk is high. It's very, very high. If we burn in New Mexico, we don't care about the smoke, there's no houses, just keep it under control, you're fine. You know. Down here, it's like, you know, so fire department says by 6 p.m., this has to be up. So, you know, you do this one minute. Yeah? So, to that point, is there an alternative to burning? Can you go through and, and do some sort of thinning or mowing or some way to agriculturally get? Yes, there is a mechanical part that you could go down there and then and you see those tractors with, you know, yeah. a, a roller. Yeah. You know, so you could do that. And that is, it is widely used in, in other parts. It is called mastication. Mm -hmm. And they go down there, but, you know, the problem is that they, they leave a lot of mulch down there. And that mulch affects the native vegetation. Is, depending on how many trees there are, sometimes the, the layer is like this big. And for any reason, you have 500 acres of that, and there is a lightning down there, and it starts a fire. Those fires are very, very, very hard stuff yeah. because they go into the, the, the pit. So, somebody else? Huh? Yeah, I have a question. When you burn in a wetland, are you finding more situations where invasive plants that regenerate with fire are preventing you from using fire the way you would like to? Are you encountering that at all? 
Like I'm thinking Frank Mighty, maybe Reef Veneric Grass, things like that. Well, uh, yeah, you, basically you cannot burn Reef Veneric Grass. The fire doesn't do, excuse me, much about it. Frank Mighty, uh, you could burn it just to get rid of the, of the fuel. But, you know, it's, it's uh, unless you spray. If you're spraying and then there is a retinite is dead and then whatever, and then you, you remove that and then you probably have a better chance to go after it and do some kind of lot. But are you encountering where you won't do a burn or because of those invasive plants or not? I, I, my concern is the spread of those invasive plants. But the, the invasives are going to spread because they, don't, they are not fire adapted. Uh, some native plants, some natives are, they like fire, like cattails. And even though if it is narrow leaves or the, the native cattails, the more you burn, the more cattails you are going to have. So it is one of those things. But yeah, all depends on the situations, and it all depends on the seed bank that it is up there. Sometimes there is a unit and you burn it, and then what it is coming after that is just trash. It's all like that. And sometimes you burn the, the unit next door, and you burn it, then it is coming beautiful. I mean that probably in the past there was some kind of management, pesticide, whatever, that has had an impact on that. So fire is not as effective. It is one of those things that, you know, good luck, you know. <laughs> uh, but you know, in, in reality, the fire firing, the prescribed burn, control burn, and so on, <laughs> it is a science that is just becoming, you know, to get uh, a little bit more wide. Because, you know, there is so many unknowns. And uh, we are trying to figure out that there's the way too many variables out there. Mm -hmm. So, probably one or two more questions. Yeah? Uh, is it more difficult to do savannas or, uh, or the woods? Or is there just a difference? <laughs> if you are asking me, savannas. <clears throat> In the previous picture, where we were, did you see the black line down there? That was, uh, we were doing that because that was part of a, a group of new firefighters coming. But the day after, we were burning a unit that was around uh, 700 acres of savanna with winds up to 28 miles per hour. And you know, you were standing down there and you see, <laughs> and we were still burning, but we were able to do it. But if that fire jumped over the line, our threshold was 30 seconds. If you didn't catch it, the rate is spread, no one is going, it's just gone. So we play with that risk and then we, we, we all abide and then we went up there and we mitigate that. How? You know, going very slowly, making sure that everything goes out and then controlling everything as much as we could. Yet we have two spots and we cut it. So. <laughs> but uplands are, 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 are too, you know, they are uh, slower you know, rate of spread. But it is more dangerous in the, in the sense that there might be more holes, there will be more snags, uh, unknown things. And then, uh, uh, and then the mop up after the burn is, is brutal. You have to go to bed and, and spend a lot of time. Another question? All right. That's one. I'm reading about bees right now, and, and the, the bees will uh, not necessarily use honeycombs, they will use individual. Uh, little places in the ground or uh, hollow um, uh, twigs or something. Are you uh, causing any damage to the pollinators? That's most likely yes. But as one of the sides said down here, the, the good effects of that fire is going to overcome, you know, basically just put it black and white. But I'm going to give two and save eight. And I'm good with that. If we don't do that in 10 years, it is going to be, to be gone. I do restoration when Mitchell say they're butterflies. It's a felony and then you butterfly. In Johnson County, in TNC has <coughs> 600 acres. It's the largest population in the whole world. There are just you know, a few sites in Michigan left. There are others in Alabama, one in Maryland, I guess. And outside is the largest one. And there was a lot of concern that the control groups that we have done and continue doing out there and we're having a bad effect on the caterpillars. And you know, we showed them that, you know, that in fact, probably, yeah, 
because they are fired for that, but that doesn't mean that you know, they don't, don't, they are not going to die. So what we need is that you know, we have these areas where we are burning, and then in some areas we just have sprinkles. So we will save some refugia, just in case. But in one particular burn, we burn like 10 acres of major cellular habitat uh, grounds. And then after we burn it, we went out there and placed some cages. On top, there are these mounds. I don't know if you have been there, they have mounds. And then we know that they live there. And then the burn that was going out there, we went out there and set up those cages like tents. And then in the, we waited, and then later on, we found two major cellulars that emerged and were there. So, this, voila. You know, that doesn't mean that we didn't care. You know. But you know, how are we going to do that? You know, how are we going to demonstrate that? That uh, the way that we then demonstrate that our management techniques and the use fire is good is because the, the population has been steady and even growing and expanding. So, there must be something that we are doing for good, you know. Uh, but there are, again, there is so many unknowns out there. It's like, you know, we cannot be mother nature, so we, we do our, 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 our best, but anyways. Remember, there is good fire and bad, and bad fire. 60% of the state of Michigan is fire de dependent. Fewer, fewer than 2% of the, the forests that you see down here are original ones. And uh, the next time that you see fire, you just think about those parts, you know. So thank you so much.